Pilot Boys in the building. Let's go. Pilot Boys, we get on up. Listen to the Pilot Boys podcast. We are joined by a very special guest, founder and president of Close Up 360. Welcome to the show, Jared Zwirling, the original Jay Z. What's <laughs> up, man? How you doing? Thanks for doing hey, this. It's been a minute, but it's great to see you guys. How have you been, awesome man? You. How have you been? You know, it's been obviously a weird year for everybody. I mean, for me personally, uh, just seeing New York City the way it is right now, just it's it's so quiet. Um, you know, I used to wake up to to sirens and fire ambulances and I wake up like later in the day now because it's you know you don't hear anything that was my alarm clock for for many years so it's been a crazy year we were shut down a little bit with some production stuff but we're back at it which is exciting we're, we're back uh, filming more more and more again so uh but yeah man it's been crazy year. I've actually been back and forth between New York City and Miami so kind of getting both cities where I'm from Miami so oh what a terrible so, life yeah <laughs> right <laughs> no, it's not bad uh doing some filming down there and filming New York so just getting the best of both worlds, I guess, worth like, this crazy year. So, yeah, making the best of it, making the best of it. Yeah, so man. Let's, let's jump in, man. We got a you got a, a very interesting journey and story. So, let's let's talk about it a little bit. Um, obviously, you are a basketball nut, um, and that is what what drove you to be in the world of basketball and be, become a journalist. Yeah, Can you start by just telling us what inspired you to actually pursue this path at the outset and how you initially got in. Yeah, man, I going back to Miami, I was an outdoor kid. So I was always at the park playing, playing sports. Basketball came uh, very early. I would say around seven, eight years old. I love the, uh, I love how it brought people together. You know, I, that was the biggest thing for me. Just, you know, what, whatever race you were, whatever economic background you were from, uh, basketball was the language. And I love the culture of the game. I love the, the language, I love the the style, I love the moves, the crossovers. Just the, the there was an art to the game, and then with mm-hmm. everyone kind of coming together, I really gravitated to that, and that's what I do now. I cover all the off the court culture, lifestyle side. So it's our very early age. I was really a very observant kid. Um, I love to tell stories. I actually started writing poetry at a very young age, around eight, around that time, eight years old, and then I started writing for newspaper at around seventeen. My first job was at seventeen, which is I I can't believe it. So my whole life was around storytelling off the court, people stories, uh, just really kind of gravitating to basketball and then leveraging the game of basketball to tell those stories. And that's kind of how, how it all started back then. Awesome. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of fans, especially, you know, maybe older fans, a lot of people don't really care about that stuff. They just want to watch the game. But there's also a lot of people that do care about that stuff. And when you're actually, uh, as you, you move through your kind of journalistic career, did you find it difficult to kind of pitch – um, or get or garner interest for the lifestyle stories and the stories that weren't about basketball and what people were doing in their lives. Did you find? Did you ever find difficulty in trying to make headway doing those type of stories? Well, what really started for me was my first job. My first real job was at the NBA. I worked uh, under David Stern in the international department, and what I saw was it was the first the, the first year I was there. They drafted Andrew Bogut, number one pick in two thousand five, and uh, obviously before that it was Yao Ming. So I started to see how global the game was and how you know, just how, how much the game of basketball meant to people in other countries. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think it really, you heard about the inner cities from the United States, but then you heard about war-torn Bosnia and, like, the craziness of where these guys are coming from. You know, uh, Ronnie Stikely, who I, who I covered, uh, who's now who's now a DJ, he was the first international draft pick for the Miami Heat. Yeah. You know, through uh, the Civil War in Lebanon in, in the 1970s, uh, it was bombing outside of his place, and, and he actually had a, he had a hell of a machine gun. At, at like 10 years old. And so mm. not to diminish what happened in the United States. I just think what I'm trying to get out here is that there were so many crazy stories around where these guys were coming from to mm-hmm. just make it through basketball. And I think at a very, uh, you know, young, young age. And then obviously when I got to the NBA, I realized that there was a lot of, there was a, there was a global wealth of stories of those, these guys journeys and what they went through and how they also connected where they were from to their community work. Every guy wanted to go back to their hometown and build a basketball court or host the camp or, you know, start a foundation charity. So everything off the court connected together. And then there were family members. Um, maybe a, mom, a player's mom had cancer. Uh, you know, someone that went through a crazy situation. She was, she, uh, his dad was in jail, sold drugs. Then you connect that to like his story. There was all, I call the NBA players an octopus. The head of the octopus is their mind, but all their, all their tentacles 
or things that they do off the court, their foundation work, their business work, where they're from, their family, their family connection, their charity work, their life after basketball, their investment strategies. So I think all that connects to really the intrinsic value of, of the game of basketball and really transcends culture. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It has truly become a global sport, um, specifically with with David Stern. But, you know, I want to kind of get back to how you got your big break. Right. I know you were you're writing for a local newspaper, but then you got a big break, I think, with uh, CBS Sports. Take us into that. And and then also, like once you got your big break, obviously you weren't able to write about and create the content that you truly wanted to create. But you had to kind of go through a process of getting your feet well and building relationships and building rapport so that people trust you. Right. And as, as a young journalist, that's difficult. So can you take us into that initial phase and then what you kind of did to start establishing your relationships? Because I think that's what's most amazing about yeah. your journey is how you've been able to build the strong relationships that you've been able to build to help <clears throat> facilitate what you're doing now. I go back to when it all started, you know, I literally at eight years old, I remember my cousin and I, my cousin Craig and I were one day at his house in Jersey and he wanted to be an airline pilot and I wanted to be a, a sports, there's the sirens in New York, there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> They're back. <clears throat> um, so he wanted to be an airline pilot, I wanted to be a sports a sports writer, a sports reporter, whatever you want to call it. So right away, I was destined to do this, uh, to tell stories off the court, to tell stories about people. And so... I was always driven to to find that niche. I, it took a little while, but I, that was that was it. So it had, when I went to NYU, I had literally eight internships. So I was, you know, busting my ass to try to get into this lane. My first big break wasn't at the NBA or really CBS Sports. I, it actually came really at ESPN. So my fourth job. So I went from um, the uh, NBA to CBS Sports to Sports Illustrated, and then to actually Sports Illustrated Kids, and then oh, to wow. ESPN. So uh, th- it actually kind of came crazy. So I was. Um, I was looking for a job at the NBA or at the ESPN to cover the basketball side. And so I actually hit up a, a editor there about covering a game just to go to a game, just to experience it. And he wrote me back saying, Jared, do you want to uh, become the blogger for the Knicks for ESPN? I said, hell yeah. It was not a lot of pay. Yeah. I was working for ESPN, the magazine, doing research, reporting, basically just, you're just fact checking stories, right? Just finding errors. So uh, I said, hell yeah. So I went to the game and I think as I got into the locker room for the really first time, this is 2010. So literally 10 years ago, that's when you start realizing how versatile guys are off the court. You talk to yeah. Chris Copeland, you talk to Jeremy Lin, Carmel Anthony, Armari Stoudemire. Not to mention New York City, there's a lot going off the court. I remember covering New York City Fashion Week. Then this billboard, this activation, Carmel Anthony goes traded in 2011. Next thing you know, he's got watch deals. He's got every deal you can imagine off the court because he's leveraging New York City. So that's when it made me realize, man, these guys – are thinking so much more than all, than on the court, you know, and that was the big break, I think. And then when I got into the conversations with players, because I was always into really talking to guys, not reporting on players. I was really talking with them. I put my tape recorder down. It was just conversations. I think a lot of reporters in New York want to they, they want to cover the tabloid side, the drama side. They want to get players to say something that will be on the back page of the New York Post. But I went in more with like just let's talk, let's just talk. So I think they trusted me that I came to them with a different angle, that I was more genuine that I really want to get to know them as people. And then that really led to the big break of cracking these off the court stories. And then from there on, it kind of went from there. <clears throat> Let's talk about that for a second too, because you know, you mentioned, uh, and you talked about it, you mentioned that some of this a little, a little bit as well, but just kind of the personal side of it. I think a lot of times uh, the, from fans, most of the time they're looking at NBA athletes or professional athletes, they look at them as kind of these like superhuman superhero people uh, without feelings and just, only care at one dimensional and all this type of stuff. Tell us a little bit more about what it is that you kind of learned over the years um, from having these type of conversations, having these type of personal relationships and interviews with these players. Well, they want to do so much. I mean, it all starts with uh, their first contract. They want to give back to their hometown. Uh, I think now with this rookie class coming in with the social justice movement, with coronavirus, a lot of rookies are thinking already about their hometown. You know, years ago, guys were not thinking about this stuff until maybe they were 30, getting their last deal, maybe five years from retirement, literally an 18 year old kid coming in right now. Um, you know, I'm actually gonna be working with Lamella Ball and his mom, Tina had a stroke, uh, she's a stroke survivor. So we're gonna build a really cool campaign with Lamella Ball around around stroke prevention. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited about that, that that's, uh, stay tuned for that. He's 18 years old, so uh, maybe he might be 19 now, you can you can check that, but uh, I think the, the, the players coming in now, their mindset is 
on so much more off the court immediately. The contracts are higher too. That's a big part of it. They have more money to give back, to donate. But, you know, they want to do a lot of things. I, I think that their mindsets are in how do they take care of their families, number one, how they take care of their hometown, number two, how do they find some good investments early on. Um, a lot of the deals now are different. Years ago it was restaurants and now it's more equity deals, uh, energy drinks, you're seeing more of that. Uh, you're seeing more real estate deals, housing, housing development deals. A lot of guys want to build low income housing developments uh, for affordable housing for their for you know people from their hometown. Uh, so you're seeing more equity deals. I think Andre Iguodala was a great example of that. You know, he's now on all these mobile tech conferences talking about all his investments in equity deals from still being being up with the Warriors and getting into Silicon Valley. Um, <clears throat> you're talking about guys that are just want to take more of a leadership role. Guys that want to be on the executive committee of the, of the Players Association. Want they want to. Lead, be a leader for their for their teammates, their players around the NBA. You're seeing guys, more guys want to do more overseas. Malcolm Brogdon, not even from Africa, he's building water water wells in Africa, and it's incredible the work. Uh, um, Dwight Howard doing stuff in Tanzania, uh, helping uh, girls that go through periods and are ashamed and and don't want to go to school because they have their periods, and bringing them a place of comfort and housing that they can feel better about themselves. Which mm. there's not a lot of uh, dietary. Um, I forget what they're called. Uh, pa- basically, uh, there's not a lot of pads in those areas for for girls to stay healthy and, and feel confident. So it's just incredible where their minds are at. They really are more than an athlete. It's exciting to see truly what they're really passionate about. It is basketball, yes, but they're playing basketball like two hours a day. You know, the rest yeah. of the day they're doing a lot more. So it's really cool to see. And what do you think? What do you think is the reason for that? Because there's, I mean, there's probably it's probably a confluence of reasons. But you know, I know LeBron gets a lot of credit for making. Yeah. Uh, NBA players specifically think outside of the box and think bigger and understand the, the uh, bigger right. implications of, of their brand. Um, and maybe it's just the times. Maybe people are getting more quote unquote woke as as the times have, have yeah. kind of evolved. But what do you think is the reason for why you, you didn't used to see that stuff before, but now you're seeing it in abundance now? The, the biggest thing is social media. The world's so connected now. I mean, it's like if a tragedy happens, everyone's connected on Twitter, everyone's on Instagram seeing the photos, the live updates. Just it's it, every, everything's more connected now. I think people kind of know where they where they need to make an impact. It's all visible now. So that's that's the biggest thing to me. There's more information flow now. You know, years ago, international player was. Uh, I talked to Ryan Cycli about this. He said, you know, back then they were considered like an alien. Like, who? You're from Lebanon? What? But now there are scouts around the world finding talent in every far uh, area of the world. Uh, you know, so there's there's no such thing as a distant player or distant story everything is just connected now i, I think that's that's really the beauty of, of basketball too being a global sport and just how guys want to you know they they read they read about things they know about things the nba is such a small community um and i think that that really helps it a lot too to, to understand like when one guy does a business deal everyone knows about it you know, right. you, you know it, right. was, it was more siloed where you know it wasn't as uh, open now but the flow is there and, and, and then guys are um, you know, I, work, I used to work for the Players Association, so I really saw firsthand there really how connected the brotherhood really is. Yeah. I wanted to, to, to ask you, spend some time working for David Stern. Um, and he gets a lot of credit for, A, turning the basketball, turning basketball into a global phenomenon that it is. Um, and then the second thing is empowering the players, right? Can you tell us a little bit about him? Rest in peace, obviously, yeah. and his influence. He's one of the most highly regarded commissioners. Tell us what you saw that made him special and what, why he was able to accomplish the things that he was able to accomplish. Um, yeah, I, I, the first thing that comes to mind is the global side. And I actually, like I said, I started my career in, on the international sports side of the NBA. So we were actually delivering programming to 247 countries around the world. NBA, uh, game time, footage, you name it. Every show we were sending out and, and the appetite was really immense. I also started the year that Basketball Without Borders started. That was a big part of David Stern. Basketball Without Borders has been an incredible program to get uh, grassroots efforts in Africa, Europe, South America, India now, excuse me, just really getting that grassroots push. And a lot of players have come through there, through those Basketball Without Borders uh, camps to come to the NBA. The NBA, at the end of the day, they want to have their area in every place in the world to get talent to the league. Uh, and through that, the broadcast deals have really heightened as well. So that's been a big part of the, global, the, global, the globalization side, the grassroots side. China, huge, huge market. I was in China last year for the FIBA Basketball World Cup. It's incredible. I mean, what can I say about China? I mean, right now it is going through a lull right now. Unfortunately, Daryl Morey's tweet, uh, the, politi- the politics there, coronavirus, it's been hurt. But 
I'm talking to people that are part of my company, just people that, that, are, that are working there. They, they say China will see a rebound next year, which is good to hear. But China has 400 million basketball fans. I mean, it's incredible. I was there and I went to like, you know, little parks and the guys were playing, you know, they were wearing NBA jerseys. Uh, the FIBA World Cup was special. So that's also a big part of David Stern, China. And getting into that Asian market, I think what David really allowed Adam Silver to see was other areas of the world that they can go after. I think under Adam Silver's watch, it's been India for sure. Yeah. And then market is no question Africa. Uh, the basketball Africa League was going to start this summer, but obviously coronavirus delayed that. So it's tipping off next summer. But Africa is the one market to watch right now. A lot of more players are going back there. A lot of American players, like I said, Malcolm Brogdon, Dwight Howard, that are not even from Africa. But that league is is really hot. There's sponsors getting in there. I just saw Bismack Biombo last week in Miami. He actually wants to buy a, a basketball Africa League team, uh, doing tremendous work there in the uh, the Congo. So that that's a yeah. So I think David really made it realize like, wow, this could be global. And now with Adam's watch, they're pushing more markets to get there. You brought you brought up Adam, and and he's you know a figure that we respect tremendously, and and it seems that he has a lot of respect around the league as well. And it's interesting now because now is a very interesting period of time in terms of. Uh, being a commissioner or being the leader of a league because the eyes are not just about, okay, are you, are you growing the league and are you, you know, making money, but it's, are you listening to the players? Are you advancing social issues? Are you, you know, what are you doing in response in response to kind of everything that's happening in society? One of the things that Adam Silver has excelled at, at least in my perspective is that is making sure that they, they include the players, the players voices are being heard, um, that they're a respected part of this thing, not just, owned by the owners yeah. right um do you get the sense that you know the nba players uh the, the reason why the nba has kind of capitulated a, a little bit to some of the things is because it's it, it realizes the importance of social justice or do you do you get a more of a sense that they're they also realize that without this league this, these guys don't exist and so it's kind of something that they just need to do to survive or is it too hard to even tell the difference I think the big thing that Adam, Adam has seen is that the uh, the player's marketability is the best in all of American pro sports. You look at an NBA role player, they, ha- they might have more followers on Instagram than an NFL star, like Kyle that's Kuzma true. or, you know, for example. So that that's a, even the guys coming into the NBA, LaMelo Ball and uh, Zion Williamson, they had more followers like an NBA star. So I think he just sees that the, the uh, marketability and the social media presence of these guys is there. Their voice is heard. They're very public. No hat, no helmet. Uh, they see how public facing they are. LeBron James, I mean, let's face it, he's been a huge part of this movement. He has over 70, I guess, 2 million followers now on Instagram. I mean, obviously, he's a, a movie star and Space Jam coming out next year. He just does it all on the public uh, public level. So that's been a big influence for other guys to step in. And then his platform, Uninterrupted, has a big has a big part of that, too, in that you know, guys are really having a platform to express themselves, to get out what they want to say. So I think Adam is a really – he's a player's commissioner. He sees what – uh, these players want. He listens to them. I think David listened to, but I think with David, he was more of the business guy. He was more of like, let's push the NBA, mm-hmm. Not to push the NBA with the players support. I think it's a little more of like a joint effort to me from what I see. I haven't really worked with Adam directly, obviously, but I yeah. do see there's more of a joint effort there that it wasn't just so much David. Now it's Adam and, and LeBron and the whole player staff really pushing together. I think that's a unique thing we're seeing. And I wanted to touch on something that you were, you mentioned about how, NBA players, their following and their platform is so much bigger. Um, I wanted to ask you about about that because it seems like, as we see with basketball specifically, we're finding out about young talent sooner and sooner and sooner, right? Like when they're five or six years old. How much of an impact, we've seen the impact of like Mikey Williams, for example. Um, how, how much is that driven by the media, right? Like how do you... And, and what are kind of the the pros and cons of that, right? Of of elevating these oftentimes young kids to superstar status before they've even entered the pro leagues. Wanted to, to to ask you about that as well. The big thing there has been, I think, the brands are focusing a lot more on the on the summer circuit. I, I think that's been a big push. I, I mean, we work with, we work with Ball is Life. I mean, their impact over time too. Those brands, I think, saw the when you know LeBron was. 17 years ago now, which is crazy. And I think that started something where I think the uh, the idea of like a hype, the hype, the hoopla of a young basketball yeah. player really came to more for, for uh, formation. So I think from there, more brands started pushing content to those games, more media to those games. 
uh, more reporters to those games to cover that overtime, ball is life, Amar is real. These are just some of the examples of the, of the companies that have elevated high school hoops to get these guys more awareness and obviously push their social media presence. I remember that, that move LaMelo had where he came down and uh, uh, half court, he pointed down, I'm going to shoot right here, and he shot it and made it. That's that, that sets off the whole alarm around basketball, media, and the highlights because these young kids are coming in. Also, the skill level is crazy too, right? You're seeing like a guy like James Wiseman, he's seven feet, but he can do it all. He can dribble, he can uh, perimeter game, post-up game. So the, the tall guys coming in now are so versatile. Kevin Durant was a big part of that, that push to see the versatile big man. That has also elevated it too, where you know you can see a guy do it all and people are just blown out of proportion. Like Bobo, for example. Bobo was like, you know, I think he probably has 800,000 followers on Instagram because he was just this anomaly, seven foot skinny not even like his father knew Paul, but could do it all could shoot you know drive dunk you know so the nba player itself as a athletic specimen has also elevated those brands to put more emphasis to covering that so v to your point definitely media but it's also the ascension of the nba player or just the physicality athletic ability of the player it's just a unique breed right now and people are capitalizing on that let's talk about close up 360 um the the company that you that you started and uh, it's just an exceptional company. And you've talked about it, I guess, a little bit um, throughout this show in terms of what you've done. But let's talk more specifically about that company, your inspiration for starting it and what exactly it is that you're doing and um, maybe some of the projects that you're working on now. Yeah, no, definitely. Mecca. So the, the vision was simple. I wanted to create a, a true global destination for off the court content that capitalized on NBA players, popularity, marketability off the court. Uh, you, know, you look at just what they mean to culture, to brands, to lifestyle, to fans around the world. They offer so much uh, beyond the game. And I, I really want to tell all the different stories, not just the star guys, but even the role players, you know, that have so much equity and interest among fans, not to mention around the world. There's over 120 international players now. So their market value in those countries is, is elevated now. And because of that, then those fans want to watch the NBA and get to know those players that play with. Those, those players of their, of their country. So Luka Doncic with the Mavericks, they want to know about all the players on that team because they were watching Luka Doncic play. So the the market, the appetite for getting to you know these guys on a deeper level, I think social media has had a big part of that where, you know, when I saw the evolution of Instagram, that really had a big influence on me too because you saw guys posting their pregame outfits, their sneakers. You know, fans want to get closer and closer. And now with Close Up 360, you're not just learning about them through a social media post, but now you're going to see a 20-minute mini documentary you're getting that deep dive on like what their what, what their passion is but why their passion relates to what they do off the court a good example of that is um bobby Portis with the new york knicks uh he has a single mom and um a tina and uh you know a lot of what he's doing now he started a single mom a single a foundation to support single moms and so we were part of his foundation launch last year in little rock arkansas to be there for that to see how they work together how they have this special relationship and how they give back to other single moms in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is a tough, yeah. so tough city. So it's really cool to kind of take these stories and, and dive into them. And I think that's one thing that we're trying to do a close up is really elevate that for players off the court. And, and can you talk a little bit about the challenges, right? Because you went from being a journalist with big entities that kind of assigned you roles to now being an entrepreneur and starting up your own business. Take us into some of the challenges that you, that you kind of faced even making that transition. From, from having a, a job to now being an entrepreneur and running your own thing? I mean, the challenges are still going on today, and not because of coronavirus, but, you know, when you're young and you, like, you guys love what you do, I can tell. you. I know you guys really well. I mean, I love what I do. It's, it's, I can do this for free, but ultimately you can. And so the, always the challenge is converting a passion into a business. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's always, even today, it's like every idea I have, I have so, I have so, I have a document of like a 50 page document of just ideas. <laughs> and then you kind of have to realize like what's going to really drive your business forward. You know, if I could do all these ideas, I would do them. You know, mm -hmm. give me a ten million dollar budget, I'll go out and do it. I don't even care how where it ends up or you know how much money it makes. I'll just do it because I just want to do it. Yeah. So it's just, it's always it's always been about turning a passion into a business every single day. Uh, I have a great team around me too. I can't credit myself. Even Rama, uh, you know, Rama Raju, uh, our director of, of, of business uh, brand partnerships. I mean, we we push each other every day. He pushes me too to. Jared, what's the business here? What, how could we make turn this into a, a rev share or get a brand involved? So it, that's always the thing with me is like, I love this every day, but I always have to turn money for not just for our company, but for players. You know, we have to make monetary value for them 
through our distribution deals, through our licensing deals, through all that stuff to, you know what, if every deal we do, players not going to just give us our story for free. You know, we, we want to help them out too. We want to give them some return to that because they're trusting us to do that story for them, but they want to see the visibility of that. How can I make some money off of that? So that's mm-hmm. our big push, distribution, licensing, branded partnerships, rev share deals, um, you know, creating campaigns for players that leverage an off the court passion or interest of theirs. So it's a lot of things that we try to do. And I think this year, definitely we got hit hard with coronavirus. We couldn't do as many productions, but we're trying to set ourselves up for next year to get back on track and, and build. But we're, we're in a good spot. We have some really good good projects ahead. I'm, I'm excited about it. I think uh, we have some good things ahead. So we'll see, man. It's going to be an interesting year. Let's talk about some of those. Uh, I know yeah. there's, you're working on something with uh, Karan Butler and Yellow Brick. Talk to us a little bit about what that is. Yeah. Yes, the Quran. Uh, I met Quran when I was at the Players Association. Quran, uh, I don't know if you guys know Quran. He, he's just one of those unique, versatile guys in sports. Yeah. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. He's a real estate guy. He's on NBA TV. He's uh, just he's a very versatile, award-winning uh, producer, book author. So Quran made a lot of sense for us because he's so versatile, right? Off the court, mm. so we really saw what we were doing. Wanted to work with us. Uh, when the when um, when George Floyd passed away, unfortunately, and other incidents happened. Quran has been a huge advocate for social justice and criminal reform, uh, criminal justice reform and police reform. So he really wanted to do something special in Racine, uh, Racine, Wisconsin, where he's from around Juneteenth Day. So we went back there and we filmed the whole feature around his day out there, how he was giving back to the community, the, the, the marches there, just really showing his, his impact in Racine. So from that, we created about a 20 minute documentary. And then through that, too, we created a scholarship opportunity where kids from his hometown and around the country would have a chance to watch the feature, kind of chime in on it, how it had an impact on them, and then they would be entering a chance to win a scholarship from Quran. So that's how that's I put it together, a really impact piece to his hometown and then really giving back to kids. Obviously, a lot of people are out of work right now. The job employment rates are, are really low. Uh, people are just you know, looking for job transitions. So Quran really wanted to instill that and get people you know, opportunities to, to move forward. So that's how the whole thing came about. That's awesome. So awesome. And also, we've talked, you've touched on coronavirus a couple of times and how that's impacting all of us. Uh, another project is the, the, the Hoopers Meet Heroes, where yeah. you've kind of set up um, opportunities for frontline workers who are kind of saving all of our lives right now to interact and meet basketball players. Tell us about that and how that came together as well. Yeah, that was our first project when uh, coronavirus hit. We realized that we couldn't uh, go out and produce projects, so we had to get a little creative. Uh, we weren't used to this, like just like you guys right now on the StreamYard. We used the service StreamYard.com to basically link up players with uh, frontline healthcare workers through uh, through remote chats, and we had them side by side. And we did about uh, I think we did twenty three of them. So we had a player in each city with a frontline healthcare worker in that city, uh, whether it was a nurse, an ER physician a pulmonologist, you name it, and they, they talked together about what was going on, how it impacted their city where they were playing, and it was really great. We did 23 of them, and um, and I was very happy about that. We called Hoopers Me Heroes. We thought it was a great title. It made a lot of sense, and that's how it started. We're, we're, we're trying to push that forward now uh, in some different ways. So, you know, we have a lot of projects now that have made us busy, but uh, we, uh, we want to make sure we leverage that the right way. At the time, it was a great concept because it made, it made conversations easy through remote chats, and it made really great conversations that really changed people's landscape and mindset about what was going on, especially because players, they reach a younger younger audience. So we want to get the younger people to realize wear a mask, stay inside, social distance, right? And young people can look up to these players and understand that, you know, they might not watch CNN, but they'll watch CJ McCollum talk to a physician. It might influence them to understand what's going on. That's how it all started. That's awesome. I, uh, I want to get more to the impact of coronavirus, too, like on, on the NBA uh, but before we get there, I, I have a question that you made something you said kind of made me think about in terms of new media. And, you know, it seems as though like the way that society operates now with social media, um, that media is, is is really changing. Like before it was like big TVs, big productions, big cameras, big this and that. Yeah. And now it's like you got to be a little bit more agile than that, you know, and um, and content, even the way people, you know, know consume content is different and even though maybe even the quality of what they expect you know with reality tv for example taking over it's not everything doesn't have to be as perfect as it once had to be what it, what have you seen from that space from just like a media perspective uh the opportunity there for like new new media companies to make headway i, I still think the production value needs to be really <clears throat> excuse me really strong because i think the competition is there and i think because there's so many more outlets out there 
companies really want the premier content. Mm. The social media content you're seeing on on, on Instagram, it, it's social media content. It, it's, right. it's gonna be, it's not gonna make a lot of money. You know, you still gotta put the right resources. I think the equipment now, the drones, the, I mean, we we definitely, you know, there's a high level of technology for these shoots. And yeah. if you're talking about Netflix or Hulu or Showtime, I mean, they still expect a, a very high production value. And that, that's, yeah. that's, that's that's misperception in our industry is that social content is what sells. That that's not right. true. Mm. It's just for brand building, but you you don't really sell social content. You don't make a lot of money off just social content. Right. So trying to be in the distribution game of documentary content. That is where six figure deals and plus run. Mm. Our content is just to drive two features or to just promote our social media content, but. You know, for young filmmakers out there that, that just want to shoot a 60 second clip of a guy working out, it's cool for access. It, it's not really a driver of, of, you know, monetary value. You know, you got to you got to think bigger storytelling. You know, what's the what's the six month plan or what's the nine month plan to really build out content? So, Mecca, I think I think there's still a traditional value in how like, yes, there's more technology, there's new, there's more new media. But I still think traditional storytelling and linear, you know, length story is still is where the money's at. And let me ask you one one follow up to that real quick. Too. Also, just to, not to cut you off, but that's why yeah. players that's why players are starting production companies, right? Right. Doing yeah. that that's long form content. That's Hollywood level long form. That's that's money there. Stefan Marbury, his doc, uh, kid from Coney Island. You know that wasn't you know that was that was a three year process they made money on. So yeah. you have to put in re- investment resources into these long form projects. I wanted to ask one one other question too before I forget, and I, we probably ask this to every legitimate journalist. Do you find it to be frustrating when you see that, uh, I guess, the barrier to entry is t- to be a journalist now yeah. I mean, in cer- certain instances is, is nothing. And people coming out here and claiming that they're journalists and just mm-hmm. not doing the not doing the work that you had to do. How 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 do you feel about that generally and how do you deal with deal with that reality? Because that is part of the competition and the oversaturation now is not just the legitimate, quote unquote, legitimate outlets, right. who, but also just people with a good big following yeah i mean on the social media side i do think there's a lot of young talented guys that have really cool filming and editing experience but they're they're doing they're just they just know short form and i think there is talent to grow there um you know from the reporting side you know i i haven't we, we don't really report stories as, as as much as i well as what i used to i'm not going out yeah. doing like espn news stories I'm, I'm doing more doc level so the scripting of these shows and the and these uh documentaries are a little different they're more they're more in depth and more you know built out so we do take a very calculated approach to everything that we do i mean it's it's it, everything is very you know well storyboarded and so that's how we work i can't speak to like how other media companies are doing it today because i'm not on really the news side right I don't know what's happening with plagiarism or you know fake reporting or how hmm. young reporters are in locker rooms but um we we do take a very calculated rich risk uh not risk a uh, process to how we do what we do so that's how we work I wanted to follow up because you did spend some time at, at Bleacher Report and they've grown tremendously and have kind of taken over that kind of social media space. But it's also seems to have changed how the younger younger audiences also consume even games. Right. A lot of kids aren't watching the two and a half hour game. They're going to Bleacher Report. Bleacher Report is live highlighting the game as it's happening. And that's how they're digesting. Is that is that something that you think is going to be a, a, a problem for the NBA and other sports moving forward? As 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 the audience kind of kind of shifts and less and less people want to consume an entire game. Yeah, that's the challenge we face too. Everyone faces is just attention span. Is it really getting someone right away to to watch something? Everything we do is exclusive in nature, so we obviously are are trying to draw in viewers based on you can only get it here. That's part of the draw with us. You know, we don't want to just do something that's already been done or we don't want to be part of a, a group interview. We want to really get in and do it raw and unique. So that's part of the value that we offer. Now, from the uh, the, the Bleach Report, I, I used to work there. I think they do a great job with capitalizing on the fun side of sports. I mean, I look at every media brand. If you if you really dig do, uh, do a deep dive in every media brand, there's a niche there. It yeah. may be missed, but there is something that's very unique to that area. ESPN is news. Bleach Report is fun social content. Uninterrupted is um you know voices of the athlete that are sort of in podcasts or first person, first person. First person. Tribune is first person stories 
Yeah. Um, you know, I can go down the list over time and, and uh, Ball's life is mostly highlights of high school. So if you really kind of nail down, which some fans don't, there really is an identity to every brand. It's just like, what are yeah. you looking for? For us, it's long form, mini doc, deep dive off the court. So, you know, I, I just look, we, we face it in every day. I mean, we have to basically when we build our trailers and social content, they have to be as good to get someone to watch a, a feature content. So we have to use still utilize social media content. But ultimately, if we're talking about distribution licensing, then we're looking at the 20, 30 minute pieces that have to be strong enough for that audience. So, but uh, we all compete in this social media space. That's the, I will say that we're all a, kind of a, we're all similar in that regard. We all have to build for views on Instagram. I do agree there, but if you really kind of, you know, deep, do a deep dive, you'll see how every platform is different, but it's just, again, you know, we're not a big brand on, on social media. We have 19,000 plus followers. We're not going to compete with Bleach Report on that kind of stuff. So yeah. we have to find our identity. Yeah, that's that's important. Let's talk about let's talk about the NBA, um, how they dealt with the bubble and, and COVID. It it's, you know, I, I mean, obviously, as COVID was hitting, people were you know from every industry were trying to figure out what they were going to do and how they were going to deal with it. And the NBA seemed to just figure it out better than almost everybody. And I just wanted to get your perspective as someone who's in that space yeah. on how and why that happened. Just the whole bubble. Vibe? Yeah, how did they become? How did they? How did they create the bubble and become so successful? What was it that? What do you think uniquely positioned the NBA to to be successful um, with creating the bubble? They have no yeah. cases, and they've, it's been months now. Um, what do you think was the reason for that? Well, I think uh, one uh, aspect that comes to mind is the broadcast side too, right? You know, it's it's the Disney World of Sports, which is under the or below that's the ESPN umbrella. So I think uh, the NBA does a great job working with TNT and their broadcast partner ESPN to really put together really really uh, uh, awesome broadcasts with technology, uh, yeah. making it feel like, you know, when you watch it now, you don't feel like you're watching uh, just, a, you know, an AAU right. summer game. It, there's, there's, there's fan noises and, and music and the camera angle. So I get credit to how ESPN, I'm sorry, how the NBA collaborates with ESPN and TNT because it, it really starts there. They're having the broadcast experience to really give to the fan and provide them a really top-notch experience. And then as far as the logistics and the safety, I mean, I think they saw that there were multiple courts multiple hotels. I think it was really smart how they put it together. The daily COVID testing was clutch, you know, having mm-hmm. that instituted every single day. And I liked also too, how the players were there first to really, you know, let's, let's, let's protect their safety. Number one, this is a business trip for these guys. Don't bring yeah. other people in there. It's a business trip. Let's focus on playing and excelling. That was a great move. The players might've missed that early on. There were some complaints, but I think eventually they realized like, you know, this is a good move. And then the family members came later. But the NBA is first class. I mean, they they really look at things very carefully. I think, um, you know, I give a lot of credit to the players, too. That's why the NBA is yeah. so strong as a, as, an, as a league is that the players are so together. So Chris Paul, LeBron, all the guys are talking to the commissioner directly. There is a, a really good bond there. So the players are really asking and getting things that they want, too. Yeah. So it will work out at the end of the day because players are having a strong voice. And Adam definitely listens to them like we were talking about before. Yeah. And, right. and let's let's talk a little bit about the NBA too. Beyond now that they're in the bubble and, and games are occurring, we haven't had any cases. The second part of this is also the NBA's em- embracing of social justice issues on court, on broadcasts, in their coverage, yeah. which is which has caused some some tension, right, with fans because there's some fans who say, well. We don't want to see that in our in our sports. We don't want to have to deal with that in our sports. And that had to have been a very difficult decision to make because and, and a decision prior to this that had never been made in any sport, right? To actually have players carry it on their jerseys, have the messages on the court. Talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on that and, and the challenges that come because the ratings are actually down. Yeah. We're all and, and there has been a price that the NBA has had to pay for this from a band perspective, the fact that they're still doing that despite the potential financial ramifications of this. Yeah, man, it, it is tricky, but I, I think you had to do it. They had to do it. The players had a voice. Some guys boycotted not playing, not going to Orlando, so you had to listen to the guys. I think Michelle Roberts and Chris Paul were really big on this. You know, Michelle Roberts is the first African-American leader of a, uh, a sports union. She's huge in this, um, you know, with working with Chris Paul and that, you know, those, those guys on the uh, leadership side on the MVPA, huge part of how these things happen. Uh, there's a close bond there. And again, Adam is listening. Adam is listening. I think 
I think the NBA has seen this whole year as a downfall business wise. China was hit. Uh, you know, they missed half of the year basically with yeah. coronavirus. I mean, it's been a business hit across the board. So, you know, at the end of the day, you have to listen to the guys who are giving you your product, which is the players. This is a they, they the NBA sees this as a, as a short term kind of burn, you know, I mean, but they did have to get the games back. So the next leg is next season. What happens? The big question is what happens next year. Right. What is, where are they going to be playing? You know how players are going to take in this whole social justice movement. I, I'm very curious about that. But right now, this had to be done. I mean, the players weren't going to play. Players, players left the game. The, the Bucks weren't going to even show up. You know, I think they left. Uh, they didn't even show up on game one, right? They just said they mm-hmm. just had the locker room. So what do you do? You know. So I, I think I give credit to Adam and Michelle taking a stand. You know, again, it's going to be a business hit either either way. So what, that's that's what you got to do. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the on court stuff a little bit too, because the. You know, the reality is that we're actually seeing really good basketball right now um, and all across the board. There's a lot of older talent that's hanging on and, and being relevant. And there's a lot of younger talent that are starting to make a name for themselves. And it appears that the NBA is in really good hands. I have two questions. One is, who do you think is going to win the championship? Uh, how do you think this is going to yeah. actually play out? And then the second question is, do you get a sense that from the players, I guess, or maybe or maybe even media, that there's going to be an asterisk next to this championship because of all the circumstances surrounding it. Yeah, I mean, it's going to come up in all those Skip Bayless conversations. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be like, you know, who's better, Jordan, LeBron, you know, yeah. Jordan, Kobe. So, um, you know, the, the gameplay has been so good, man. It's, it's, been, it's been awesome. I think a lot of guys are talking about, you know, not uh, – the, the lack of travel has made the gameplay better. Mm-hmm. So – you know, I, I don't know. Asterisk, I, I don't know. I think they, they played enough games for me and also the game set best of sevens that are still doing the full playoff format that, why, that I, to me, there's no asterisk. It's the, the real playoffs. So I'm with it. As far as the championship, I go with uh, the Lakers and LeBron, man. You know, I just think that as long as the LeBron is at the highest level and, Kate, and Anthony Davis is putting in still 25, 30 points per game, those two guys are at the beast. I think they're unstoppable. Plus, they have the guys that can shoot. They have the defense. I think the health is the biggest thing with LeBron. If you can just kind of maintain that all the way through, and Anthony right. Davis is up there with them, they have the role players to get it done. So I'm I'm going with the Lakers. And, and you know, it seems like there's a lot more parity since it was last off season with some of the free agency decisions that were made. You know, with Durant. You know, I know he got a lot of flack for going to Golden State, but his decision to to leave that team and go go out east and some other decisions that were made in the free agency pool made the NBA more competitive, right? And gave it more parity. But there are still challenges that that small market teams face. And one of the bigger ones is what's going to happen with Giannis, right? He's the best player in the NBA right now, but he's in a, in a situation in Milwaukee where Kevin Durant isn't going to go to Milwaukee, right? Yeah. And, and other kind of superstar players aren't going to go to a market because – they also care about some of the off the court stuff. Talk to us about those challenges. And do you see Giannis staying in, in Milwaukee long term, or do you think to win he's going to have to leave that market? Well, they want to get him to that max extension, so that's going to be a big part of it. I mean, the, the Heat are definitely after him. The Heat would love to have Giannis. I just think they have to they have to trade too many pieces right now. The Heat are just so competitive right now, so I, I wish they don't they don't do that. I'm from Miami, so I'm a little biased, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the it's the most challenging part about being a superstar in a in a small market. Um, you know, Katie Katie went to the Warriors because he really wanted to truly win. So I do think Giannis is at the point where it's a little trickier for him because he's younger than Katie. When Katie left to the Warriors, he was a little older than Giannis. Giannis is still really just getting started in the NBA. So it's a very interesting question. Does he want to just escape and go win with a super team, or does he still want to establish his own identity in, in his own market? So that's one thing. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think knowing Giannis, I think he's open to staying in Milwaukee a little bit longer. He loves the community there. Um, he wants to get that max extension to really feel part of the community. So I, I see him there a little bit longer. But I, I could see something happening in the next two years where he where something will go down. Um, I just don't think he's in the position to just join a super team. And I don't think that's Giannis's mindset. I think he really wants to pull it out there. So it's But it's the hardest decision for every player in, in a small market team is what do you do? Um, to 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 win to win and, and sometimes it's hard to leave a small town because you're so connected to the community there so that's gonna be the big thing for him in the next couple of years and let's talk about that we're talking about talent let's talk about the draft because you know it's gonna be much different this year right I mean just the timing of it and you know also not 
having March Madness to evaluate. I know not all players come from college, but what do you see happening with the draft this year? Um, and is there any, any any names that we should be looking out for? I think the draft is a kind of a unknown a little bit. You don't know who's going to go number one. Lamelo is it going to be Anthony Edwards? I mean, I think those two probably could go number one. Just the intrigue with Lamelo is there. I, I I saw him play a lot in Australia. I was in Australia last year and I saw him, you know, work out, train a little bit. And I just watched some of his highlights because I was there, so I was paying attention. The kid is, is legit. You know, he had yeah. two triple doubles to end the season. He does it all. He has to bulk up a little bit, but he he is a stud, better than Lonzo because he does a little bit more on the court. He has a little more athleticism than than, than Lonzo. Uh, a little better of a score than Lonzo. So I like LaMelo a lot. The dark horse is this kid, Denny, uh, from uh, Israel. Uh, you know, he uh, he's someone that's about six 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 seven. does it all. Luka Doncic two years ago came in, you know, sort of this, is he going to be a top five pick? And he was a top five pick. Denny's right. also a guy from Europe or from Israel, really, that has a chance to be that kind of do-it-all type of guy. So he's a, a really he's a really good player. No one knows much about him. Uh, but outside that, I mean, there's a lot of, I think, Kind of mid-tier talent. I don't see any like superstars in, the, in this draft. Um, the one guy with the most potential upside is Lamella Ball, and I think Anthony Edwards. Just the sense of his bulkiness at his position. Uh, he's a strong guard. Could can really get in the in the paint or shoot. Uh, James Wise was an intriguing prospect. I saw him train in Miami a couple weeks ago. He's um, he's he's better in the post right now. He does have perimeter game, but he's trying to improve his three. But he's better in the post right now. So the question is, can he get the speed up to his perimeter game to compete against a a perimeter guy, but right now he's amazing down low. He just has to get better on the perimeter with more of that that speed, quickness, and shot. But uh, it's an interesting draft. I can't say one clear cut guy, but there are some guys with some upside. What about the guy from Dayton? The kid from Dayton. Uh, Dayton, Dayton, Dayton. Oh, uh, Obi, Obi. Sorry, uh, Obi. I, you know, I want to see him train. He's training with Chris Brickley here in New York. Another guy that's interesting too. Uh, he's he's kind of like that sort of prototypical wing. Uh, really athletic. Uh, can shoot. Yeah, you know, I, I can't say much about his weaknesses, but again, another guy that has like you don't know where he's going to go. Is going to be a, a top ten player in the league or a top fifty? You, you just don't know. But he's he's obviously very talented. Yeah, one, one question, more. real quick on, yeah. on Lamelo. Do you get a sense that Lavar Lavar is kind of falling back a little bit? I don't know if it's by choice or if it's just the media stopped yeah. covering yeah. him. Do right. you feel like uh, the, there's any in, impact on Lamelo there, or do you feel like people are over just like listen, the kid can play? You know, we're not worried about LeVar Ball in the background. I think when he went to Australia, it was big for LeMelo because he didn't go there with his dad. He was literally on his own. And the NBA, by the way, the the, uh, the, the pro league there in Australia is, is really good. It's very, yeah. very good. Um uh, doesn't pay as well as China or other, some other leagues, but the competition is very strong there. In fact, there's nine NBA players who invest and own in teams in the NBA now. So mm. a very strong market for NBA talent that want to push money there to grow the league. Um, so LaMelo went there by himself with RJ Hampton who played in New Zealand, and they, they competed very very well. So there's a lot of momentum from his play there to what could happen in the draft just based on him playing at a very high level in that tough league. So And LeVar wasn't there. He wasn't dominating the news. Uh, they weren't covering him. So I think he's on his own. I think he's on his own finally. I think LeVar, I don't know, he hasn't done many media appearances, but uh, yeah. he's not taking a back seat lately. So. Also, the big ball brand hasn't been as also as, as prominent. I mean, right. LeVar signed with Puma, right? So there you go. All right. And, you know, one of the, the, the first dominoes that everyone kind of says dropped in 2020 was the passing of Kobe Bryant. Um, and what I know is that you got a chance to have one of like probably one of his last long form interviews yeah, yeah. Um, when you were in China. And I think it's we all kind of now know the impact that he had. But what I when I really saw the impact was when I was in China. Right. Like. To fully understand Kobe, you have to understand his impact beyond America. Yeah. How much he's influenced the global game. I think he probably is the most popular player globally in the world, right? So that's probably a, 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 a secondary part of why this death hit so hard, because it was truly a global event. Take us into your interactions with Kobe. Yeah. What you thought made him special. And, and his awareness, just his awareness of his role and the NBA's role, not just globally, but also with women in the WNBA and him as an advocate and kind of as an ambassador for a game and how he truly embraced yeah. that part of it. Well, I might give you a long answer here because I, I have a lot to say about Kobe. It was, it was special. So I'll give you kind of the whole story on how this happened, and then I'll, I'll kind of tell you, share some insights in it. But uh, 
I was in Shanghai for the first leg of the FIBA Basketball World Cup. And I worked with Karan Butler. And Karan, as you know, played with Kobe with the Lakers. And so Kobe was coming to China as, as he was the ambassador for the World Cup. Uh, it was him and Dirk Nowitzki. And Kobe was coming at some point. No one knew when. And I was literally about to board my flight to Sh- back from Shanghai back to New York. And Karan called me. He's like, we got Kobe. He's in to do an interview. He's flying in September 12th. He came in on September 13th. I was already on a flight back. So I literally flew back to New York. Two days later, I flew back to Beijing, literally, to just, just to meet with Kobe. That just shows you just you got to meet Kobe, right? He's working <laughs> around the world flight back to Beijing to meet this guy. So, you know, you mentioned a few things about his impact in, in China uh, with women. So the first thing when he arrived at the hotel, it was on the uh, top level of the suite area, the lounge area. Uh, Li Na was there. She's a very famous Chinese tennis player. And the first thing is his response was so amazing. I mean, you know, Kobe was saying how he's playing tennis now in retirement. He, he was saying how he's trying to learn his backhand, you know, and, and he's not doing the good job of feathering the bat, feathering the ball. He's still hitting the net a lot. So he was trying to get tips from Lee Na. But just to see the the um, the respect he had for this woman athlete was incredible. That was the first thing he did beyond anything else. No interviews, no nothing was to just say hello to Lee Na and just show how much respect he has. For this for this athlete and she was saying like i i had, I had no, no idea he even knew about me you know so that's kobe for you he does a lot of research he knows all the athletes he just really knows people he connects with people so that was a special moment and then when the uh the opportunity actually happened the interview was great one thing about kobe is that his his insights on the game of basketball because he's traveled a lot you know he grew up in italy he's been around the world china different countries so he knows how countries are developing talent he knows about their training facilities. He knows about their training workout programs. He knows about what's all that's going on around the world. He's, he's very observant on all these different things. And then uh, another interesting thing that happened, too, was I had my one of my investors with me who was uh, based in Hong Kong. He was with me that day. And my investor, Andy, does some business stuff with private equity. And he was talking to Kobe about his business. And Kobe was literally trying to break down the, my investor's business to the core, like, what are you finding your challenges? You know, what are you uh, looking at for your, how do you find your investments? Like Kobe was literally trying to find investment strategy and just met this guy out of the, out of the hole in the wall. So very, very intellectual guy, just asked very smart business questions. In fact, the deal he did with body armor was an equity deal that really set off a trend. Um, we we're talking about before about endorsement deals. When Kobe did that equity deal with body armor, that made guys realize I don't want to just be an endorser or a spokesperson. I want to actually own a part of this company. So when Kobe did that deal, everyone else wanted to do equity deals. James Harden with Body Armor and so on and so forth. So that was big with that. Uh, Kobe talked about that. But, you know, he just um, – he's a very uh, – he makes you feel, like, very welcoming. He, you know, he doesn't come across like this tall, like, out-of-the-world god God-like figure. He makes you feel very welcoming. He connects with you. I'm so sad about what happened because he was truly going to have an incredible – second act uh, the way that he connected with people with stories the way he spoke um it, it's just it's a terrible shame and i really saw up close just how everyone in that room really felt like they left that day knowing kobe bryant like they can go home and say you know what kobe's a friend of mine now you know and obviously yeah. that's not really the, the truth because kobe's you know not hanging out with you like that but you left that day like i i know kobe bryant like he i, I he and i had a great time and connected like like a like two friends would that's that's amazing. I I never got to meet him, but you know I live I live for these type of stories. I can literally listen to kind of Kobe stories all day long, you know, um, because and it seems like there there's always a very similar common theme amongst all the stories, which is that he approached people with compassion and interest, right? No matter who it was, whether it was someone that he felt like could help them help him or not, he was just always genuinely interested in people yeah. and learning and. And conversing. And so the next, I guess it's kind of a good segue into the next part of our show, which is the last part, which is where we get, you know, more uh, thoughts from you on people that you admire in two particular industries. Um, And so I guess, you know, Kobe obviously is a great segue into that. So we're going to start with the music. Um, We want to know your top five musicians of all time. Uh, top five artists that have influenced Man, you I'm gonna, in I'm gonna your life. You guys. I'm 38 years old, but I'm old so I'm going to give you, this is no particular order, I'm going to give you one shot day. I love it. I love it. I, I love mean, it for it's, many it's, reasons. It's, trust it's, me. It's, it's, it's <laughs> paradise. I mean, you just, man, shot day is just special, uh, special. Um, uh, sweet as taboo. Sweet as, yeah. So I go with shot day, man. She's a legend. Uh, Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. Uh, you hear Michael Jackson sound, you just got to, you just got to dance. Um, I would say, uh, 
Outcast. Uh, I wish Outcast was was still performing. You I want one more album for us, man. They I did. know, man. That 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 uh, that double album. Um, right. My favorite song on that album was not was not even a, a really a, a hip hop song. It was my favorite things. Mm. You know, you know, the remix from uh, um, oh man, from uh, Sound of Music with Julia. Mm. Yeah, so he, he mixed out my favorite things. Just the just the, the beat. I mean, Outcast is just legendary. Um, yeah. man, Earth Wind, Earth Wind and Fire. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. See? I love this list. This list. Right, is, this is great. Right, man. Like this uh, September, just dance songs you want to just dance to, and and um, and I have to go with the Dark Horse man, Ronnie Cycli. I think I, I his story. I, I had we did a documentary on this guy, but you know, from Beirut, Lebanon to Athens, Greece was the NBA first draft pick for the Miami Heat in 1988, then became a DJ. He's now a world performing DJ, music producer. He has the number one uh, song in the world on, in the deep house genre. Oh, wow. Blowing up. Ronnie Cycli, yeah. And he, I just like house music. I'm from Miami. I got I got like my house music. So <laughs> yeah. um, there you go. <laughs> I hit all genres right there. Also, I love it. I love uh, it. School, new school, uh, athlete, athlete turned turn yeah. music. Yeah. And this one is young right here. Out here. Know about Sade, man. These young kids today do not know. No, about no, no. They don't know about Sade. No, no they don't. Yeah. Your top five athletes that have had the most influence. I know you've gotten to interact with a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Kobe, I had the pleasure. I had lunch with Michael Jordan. I should talk about that a little bit. But I had lunch with MJ uh, six years ago in Charlotte. Uh, it was only about five reporters. We were all invited down. We spent about two hours with MJ. I met his family, his brothers, Larry, uh, his publicist, uh, Estee Portno, who handled all the Space Jam stuff, and she's been with him ever since. Got to go, MJ. Um, I remember the moment I asked him, I, I asked, when I asked MJ a question, he looked at me like, he gives you that, like, you know, he's asked, he's, he's been asked every question in the world, so when he looks at you, he's like, what are you going to ask me, you know? But that was cool, obviously. Um, man, uh, influences on me. I think Tim Duncan. I had a really cool opportunity with Tim. Mm. Uh, I went to so Tim. I don't know this, but Tim owns a auto custom auto shop down in uh, San Antonio. Yeah. So Tim, you don't know this about Tim, but he has tattoos, he has like piercings. He, the dude is like a like a rock star, like surfer dude off the court. He does kickboxing. Yeah. <laughs> so he owns a custom auto shop in San Antonio, and he he's like a hot rod guy. He knows how to customize Porsches to old Chevys. So I actually went to his shop and met him, and I met all the guys that work with him, and they're all like. Tim was actually getting a tattoo that day. So a lot of people don't know that, but Tim is a really cool dude off the court, man. Yeah. And Tim is a legend. You know, he's uh, from the Virgin Islands and all that. Um, what other players? I'm trying to think. I mean, one guy that had a big influence on me, no one's going to know this name at all, but his name is uh, Jamie Irving. So when I was around eight or nine years old, when I started writing, there was a player from our preparatory school, Jamie Irving, who was an ambidextrous pitcher. So he pitched like 90 miles an hour righty, broke his right arm, came back, started pitching 90 miles or lefty because he trained on that. So when he came back, he literally would switch in mid inning in during the during the inning between light lefty and righty pitching over 90 miles an hour. And he went to Harvard University. But I interviewed him about how that happened, how he got to be so ambidextrous. And that story had a big influence on me because that kind of got me into like the storytelling side. I was around eight years old when I wrote that story, when I interviewed him. So Jamie Irving and then the fifth. Um, Trying to think the fifth man. I mean, I think someone that was in, this is really random, but there was a girl that I interviewed when I was at ESPN. It's probably like nine years ago. Her name was Charlene Lerner, and she um, she was born without a full right arm. Uh, she had a stump, and she literally was the best shooter on her team. She would basically use the stump as her guide and shoot swishes like better than me. I, I you cannot believe this. Uh, she went on to Michigan. She didn't play there, but literally they would just show shoot pass her the ball and with her little stump. Every time was the swish, and it was just so inspiring to see that. Like no worries, she just was born like it. Pretty girl, had a boyfriend, you know, and she just she never got a prosthetic. She just would shoot that thing with a little stump, and that that was really cool, man. So that's an awesome list, man. Very good. Awesome right there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Yo, that that was that was great, man. This interview has been yeah. great. Uh, we are we're excited, first of all, for you because we've watched your journey over the last maybe decade or so, maybe fifteen yeah. years and seeing all the different moves that you've been able to make, but also just the inspiration that you've been able to bring forth. And I think that's part of, like you said that earlier, part of the reason why we all kind of do what we do is, yeah, we have passion about it, but we yeah. also want to inspire. And I think that the, telling these stories is so important uh, for so many different reasons, right? Even reasons probably beyond what you're even thinking about, but also even kind of, you're kind of restructuring the way people view this whole entire industry and the people within it. 
Uh, so we're we're going to keep cheering you, and obviously we are, um, you know, yeah. going to keep following you and wish you all the the best. And thank you so much for joining oh, us. Man. Wild Boys no, great to see you guys. It was awesome, man. Great questions, and uh, by the way, great great questions. Awesome Thanks. job. Awesome. So keep doing what you're doing, man, and stay in touch. Thanks, guys. I right, right, take care. Oh, there you go. Boys, we get on up. We don't fly, boys, we get